Last week, um, Elijah spoke on the importance of the resurrection for our faith as followers of Jesus, right? Resurrection, the most important event in the history of the world. Well, today uh, marks the end of our series on the book of Matthew. So this will be the last uh, sermon in that series. We'll be beginning a new series next week. But after Jesus was raised from the dead, Matthew tells us that he appeared to two disciples, both of whom names were Mary. And Jesus told these ladies to go tell the other disciples that uh, they were to go into Galilee to a particular mountain where Jesus would meet them. And so chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, tell us that then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now this call to reach the world with the good news, with the message of Jesus, uh, is often referred to as the Great Commission. And it's been the inspiration for countless books and songs. One such song is by this gentleman here, Keith Green. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have heard of him. He actually was one of the, the first folks involved in the Vineyard Movement. But he was also one of the first contemporary Christian music artists. And he wrote a song entitled, Jesus Commands Us to Go. The, the song goes like this. Jesus commands us to go. It should be the exception if we stay. It's no wonder we're moving so slow. His church refuses to obey, feeling so-called to stay. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, when we <clears throat> hear the, the lyrics to that song, start feeling a little bad, right? I mean, as though, like, if we don't go, if, 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 if I'm not a missionary, then I'm not really obeying Jesus, or I'm not really, if I were really serious about my faith, I would go. Keith Green says that it should be the exception if we stay. Well, should it? Yes. Well, I'm not so sure. Let's take a look at verses 19 to 20. These are the key verses. Now, I don't know if they still do this in elementary school, but when I was growing up, the teacher taught us how to diagram sentences. <laughs> right? And that's where you'd identify the noun, the verb, the subject, and the relationships between the different parts of a particular sentence. Well, sometimes when you diagram a scripture passage and pair this with a knowledge of Greek, it can help you gain a deeper appreciation of that passage. So this is the, the, the passage as it appears in most of our Bibles, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Well, this is the same passage, partially diagrammed to show the relationship between the verbs, which I've highlighted. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, going, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. These lower words are participles. They're ing verbs. And if, again, if you remember what you learned in elementary school, Participles cannot be the primary verb in a sentence. They are subordinate to the primary verb. And what's the primary verb? Make. Make disciples. There's actually only one imperative, grammatically speaking, in the Great Commission. Make disciples. Now, yes, 
the participles, the subordinate participles, probably gain a sense of a, of a command, right, from being subordinate to the imperative, make disciples, but let's put the right emphasis on the correct syllable. <laughs> right? The focus is on making disciples, not going. So what exactly is a disciple, right? Well, I think 1 John is helpful in giving us a very simple answer. John writes, whoever claims to live in Jesus, and that is living in Jesus for John means to be a follower of Jesus, okay? But whoever claims to live in Jesus, meaning a Christian, must live as Jesus did. <clears throat> so I think a disciple is someone who does the very same things that Jesus did. It's someone who is the type of person Jesus was, a person characterized by uh, love and peace and joy. I think a disciple is somebody who looks at the world the same way that Jesus did, who has a similar world view. So a disciple is someone who lives the way Jesus lived. Okay? In Greek, there are two, well, two ways to tell someone to do something. One way carries more force than the other. So you can say, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's a future. It's not, it's not technically an imperative. It is an imperative, but you're using the future tense to tell somebody that's what they should do. And then the second way you can tell them is to actually use an imperative. Okay, and that's the more forceful way in the Greek language to tell someone to do something, right? In fact, there's no more forceful way in the Greek language. This is actually from my Greek grammar book. There's no more forceful way in the Greek language to tell someone to do something than a simple imperative, especially when such a command is given regarding a specific situation. The one giving that command sees himself as an authority figure. He expects those addressed to, to do exactly as he ordered. So then Jesus clearly commands us in the strongest terms to make disciples of all nations. It's to be the great task that we are to be about until he returns. So how are we doing at making disciples? <clears throat> <laughs> Not so well. According to the Pew Research Center, this was a study that came out a couple of years ago, one in three 18 to 29 year olds have put religion aside if they ever picked it up in the first place. One in three. A sociologist named Christian Smith studied young Christians recently and found that only 40% of young Christians say personal moral beliefs are, say that their personal moral beliefs are grounded in the Bible or, or some other religious sensibility. An astonishing 61% astonishing of young Christians have no moral problem at all with materialism and consumerism. A headline on the most recent study by the Pew Center says it all. This came out last week. In the U.S., the decline of Christianity continues at a rapid pace. So we're not doing a great job at the most important task Jesus left for us to do. So what's gone wrong? I mean, how can this be? I mean, we've done everything we can to make the gospel accessible to non-Christians and the church understandable and relevant to the broader culture. We've removed the steeples from our churches. You can actually go back to the other picture. Removed the steeples from our churches to make them look like shopping malls so that people feel comfortable. We've written worship songs that sound like pop music or soft rock, because again, that's what most people are used to. We've created fun and entertaining youth groups so our kids don't have to sit through these boring sermons in the service. Some churches have even gotten rid of crosses. This church actually used to, when I came, we didn't have any crosses in this building. 
because if it's felt it, it would, it would put non-Christians off. Probably no church has done more to popularize such an approach to making disciples than the megachurch Willow Creek. <laughs> yes. The founding pastor, Bill Hybels, and his church planting team, okay, in 1975, went out and surveyed hundreds of non-Christians. They would, they would go knock on a door, and they would ask the person, do you go to church? Are you, a, you know, are you a Christian? Do you ever go to church? And if the person said, yes, I do, they'd say, well, thank you very much. Have a nice day, and they'd leave. But if the person said, no, I don't, I don't go to church, they would ask them, well, why? What are the things that put you off? What are the things that keep you from going to church? <coughs> okay? And then they took all of those answers, they tabulated them, and they created a church service, a church that would appeal to non-Christians, non-churchgoers. This approach has influenced how a generation of pastors and leaders think about making disciples. Luminaries such as President Bill Clinton regularly spoke at Willow Creek's annual Global Leadership Summit. Harvard Business School even wrote a case study on the Willow Creek model in which it laid it out saying this is the model of the future. Like this is, they, they've, they've, you know, produced this model that, that is, you know, suited for the 20th and 21st century and people need to get on board. In 2007, however, after 32 years of existence, Willow Creek finally got around to doing a multi-year study on the effectiveness of their overall method of making disciples. Okay? The report revealed that most of what they've been doing and what they had taught millions of others to do was not producing solid disciples of Jesus Christ. It was producing a lot of numbers. And let's be honest, like as a pastor, man, I'd love to have numbers. But it wasn't producing solid disciples of Jesus Christ. As Bill Hybels put it at the time, we made a mistake. What we should have done when people crossed the line of faith and became Christians, we should have started telling people and, tell and teaching people that they have to take responsibility to become self-feeders. We should have gotten people, taught people, how to read their Bible between services, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. This was in 2007. Despite the findings of Willow Creek study and their public admission that they had made a grave mistake in designing an approach that didn't create disciples, thousands of churches continue to follow just such an approach. In fact, I'd argue that it's still the prevailing approach in America to doing church, to making disciples. If such an approach doesn't work, and again, if you look at the statistics, if you look at recent studies and, and demographic studies of, of Christianity, of, of religious practices in the United States, clearly it's not working. Where do we go to find a model of making disciples, an approach to making, you know, forming disciples that actually works? Is there a different approach, one that has a proven track record of making disciples who actually have an impact on their culture? Sure. Yes, there is. And it's to be found in the early church. And by early church, I mean the church of the first 300 years of Christianity. During this time, a tiny group of followers, starting with 12 people, eventually <laughs> grew into a movement of tens of millions of people and eventually took over a Greco-Roman culture, transformed an entire culture, Greco-Roman culture that had been in existence for a thousand years. Now our picture of the church and the question for us then is this, how did they do it? How
how is the early church so unbelievably <coughs> effective at transforming the culture of convincing millions and millions of people to follow Jesus Christ? How were they so effective at creating people who, rather than being influenced by the prevailing <coughs> culture, transformed it? Because understand, we're at least in a culture where 40% of the population, I think 40-50%, still claim to believe in God, right? And we struggle, and we are rapidly declining. And I would argue the church has lost tremendous, really lost any cultural influence it has, it, it had in the past. But the early Christians, 12 people, they started in a culture that had a thousand years of no Christian influence at all. And in fact, they, far from, def from retreating in the face of that culture, eventually convinced so many people in that culture to give their lives to Jesus that the entire culture changed. How did they do it? Well, our picture of the church and how it made disciples is influenced primarily through the book of Acts. Right? And if you remember, in the second chapter of Acts, the followers of Jesus are gathered in an upper room. The Holy Spirit falls upon them, and uh, there's a mighty rushing wind, right? and, and the Spirit falls upon them. And... Uh, Flame appears above their head, right? And they begin speaking in other tongues. And, and Luke, the writer of Acts, the doctor, tells us that a large group, a, a large gathering of people, a large, large, large number of bystanders who heard the sound of the Holy Spirit, this rushing wind coming upon the early Christians and, and saw the Christians presumably maybe pouring out on the streets and, and praying in tongues, a large crowd of onlookers started talking to Peter and were wondering what was you know what's going on what's all the fuss and they were Jews it was a, it was a high religious festival an important religious festival in Jerusalem and so there were Jews from all over the world who had gathered in Jerusalem and, and if you remember Acts Peter preaches to the crowd Luke tells us that, and he's, he's incredibly success, effective. Luke tells us that on that day, 3,000 people were added to the church. Wow. And so they believe, boom, and immediately, come on in. They're part of the church. And if you continue to read in Acts, right, much of Acts tells the missionary journeys, talks about the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, where he travels from city to city throughout the Mediterranean world, preaching the gospel to sometimes large gatherings of people and planting churches and then moving on to the next city. Okay, so we get the impression we get from Acts is of Christians preaching publicly the gospel to hundreds if not thousands of people. Okay? And that, that when, when somebody converts, they get baptized immediately, and they immediately become part of the church. Mm -hmm. But as Yale historian Ramsey McMullen yep. points out, however, that after the first century, the traveling Christian missionary fades almost entirely from the scene. And public preaching of the gospel declined as well because of persecution. Increasingly, those people who converted to Christianity were required to go through rigorous and lengthy instruction before they were even allowed to be baptized and admitted to the church. As historian Alan Kreider puts it, unlike many churches today, the early church did not try to grow by making people feel welcome and included. I repeat that. Unlike many churches today, the early church didn't try to grow by making people feel welcome and included. Civic paganism did that. 
In contrast, the churches were hard to enter. They didn't grow because of their cultural accessibility. They grew because they required commitment to an unpopular God who equipped people to live in a way that was richly unconventional. Sunday worship gatherings were, in fact, closed to non-Christians. And as I mentioned, those wanting to be baptized and join the church were first required to undergo two, sometimes three years of instruction before they were allowed to do so. So why the change in how converts were admitted to the church and baptized, right? Between Acts, the picture we get in Acts, and what very quickly developed in the church. Well, I have an hypothesis. I've never read this anywhere, but I'm pretty sure this is what happened. Early on, the majority of converts to Christianity were from where? Whom? Israel. Jews. And so you're talking about people who, have, since the time they were children, have grown up in the synagogue schools, who grew up hearing scripture, in fact, memorizing scripture in a way that none of us even come close to, right, knowing. They knew God's word from the time that they were little kids. And so when a Jew decided to follow Jesus as the Messiah and join the church, he or she was already had a well-rounded well and developed Biblical view. They knew the story of salvation. They knew the Old Testament. And they practiced, had grown up in a community that was practicing a, a, a biblical ethics. Right? It wasn't following the ethics of the broader Greco-Roman culture. But very shortly in the history of the church, as the church grew and spread outside of its Palestinian context, fewer and fewer Jews, right, were converting, and more and more, what? Pagans, Gentiles, more and more people who had grown up with no biblical, I mean, they never even heard of a Bible. Never, never heard any scripture read in their entire life had a worldview that was thoroughly imbued with a paganism was it, was, that was at complete odds with the biblical worldview. And they practiced ethics that were completely at odds. I mean, the Jews, for instance, if you remember, you know, just again, to speak of just one example, Jews practiced sex was reserved for marriage between a man and a woman. If you were coming from a Greek culture, for instance, you would have, as a boy, had a, 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 a male homosexual who would have come and introduced you to homosexual sex, mentored you, and once you reached puberty, the relationship would have split, and you then would have taken a prepubescent boy as your lover and begin to... Okay, that was the prevailing relationship in Greek society, in Greek culture had been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. That's a very different, I mean, whether you agree with it or not, right? Like, that's very different than, than a Jewish way of looking at the body and sex. And so, what you got, when increasingly, people coming from, again, a background where they had a completely different worldview and different ethics from the, you know, than Jews, but they were admitted into the church immediately, you got what you had in Corinth, for instance. I mean, read, read the Paul, Pauline letters. The churches he's writing to, they're a mess. I mean, Corinth is, is the, the prime example of, of you've got people in the church who were, these are all Christians, mind you, who've been baptized, who've had an experience, radical experience of the Holy Spirit, who experience... God's power and presence in their midst when they gather as the church. But you've got guys in the church going to, going to prostitutes on a regular basis. Right? Like, if you're a healthy church, you probably shouldn't be having a lot of guys like, hey guys, what you doing after church? Oh, we're going to go check out some prostitutes down at the local temple. 
Right? Like, you've got real problems. You have people, you got one guy who's sleeping with his stepmom, right? And everybody knows about it. You've got people who are going and eating food that's been sacrificed to idols at the foot of an idol. And doing so in such a way that it's clear that the idol, in a spiritual sense, is communing with them. They're communing with a pagan idol. You've got wealthy people who are continuing to recognize class distinctions in the way that they celebrate their communion meal together. The wealthy people are in their own little private dining room in the house while the rest of the poor plebeians, the rest of us, you know, are in the courtyard of the house and the rich people are just going ahead and enjoying all their nice fine food and getting drunk and, and having a big feast and all the rest of the poor, poor members of the church you know, probably eating some crusts of bread out in the, right? And so they're, for all intents and purposes, they're continuing to act like the pagans. And so I think what happened was that very early on, well, we know this is what happened, the church realized it needed a much more rigorous, lengthy discipleship process. They realized they needed to spend more time instructing converts in biblical knowledge and the ethical requirements of the Christian life. They needed to spend more time reshaping the worldview and, learn, uh, and, and the life habits of all of these converts who were coming into the church. Kreider also points out that in today's evangelistic approach, the way we think about reaching people, Right? In contrast to today's approach, the early church's primary witness was not a product of what Christians said, but of what they did. Again, public preaching was virtually dropped off the map very shortly after Acts. Why? Why? Because you get killed if you do it. Why didn't they invite people to their Sunday services? Execution. You got killed. If I invite Donnie, Donnie's this nice pagan guy who sidles up to me at work and is like, hey, man, like, can you tell me about this Jesus kid? And I'm like, yeah, come, you know, every Christian in Ithaca is going to be meeting together this Sunday. And Donnie goes, oh, and he's sitting in the back taking down names. Well, he can wipe out the entire church in a city in one fell swoop. All he's got to do is hand that over to the, the local authorities. Okay? So, as Kreider points out, in contrast to today's approach, the church's primary witness was not a product of what Christians said, but of what they did. The non, what you'd have, non-Christians and Christians, right, would be living together and, you know, sometimes in the same family. Obviously, we're talking about extended families. We think of a family as like a parents and 1.2 kids. Right? And in the ancient world, a family was, an, was actually an extended. You had relatives, you had slaves, you had people who were looking for favors from you if you were a wealthy person. And so you're talking about 25, 30 people sometimes living in, right? And, so, and in many of those houses, those households, you know, you might have one or two Christians, but everybody else is pagan. So you had, you had Christians and non-Christians who were living together, who were working near one another. And what's important to recognize is that cities in the ancient world were much denser than cities are, than modern cities are today. Estimated that there are 100 inhabitants per acre in Manhattan. There were 200 people per acre in Rome. Okay. What this means is that people were able to observe their neighbors on an intimate level. Right? We didn't have our nice big homes in the suburbs where we didn't even know our, our neighbors. We don't know our, the names of our neighbors and we hardly see them. I mean, people were living cheek and jowl with one another. And most people lived in apartment houses that were four to five stories high. And many of the rooms were divided into multiple sublets. And so you just have people just cram-packed in there. And so what this means is that people were able to observe their neighbors on an intimate level. And Christians led such exemplary lives, lives that were clearly different than those of the pagans, that people were attracted to them 
and interested to find out why they were different. Okay? Another way, and another, Ramsey Mullen points this out in his book, Christianizing the Roman Empire, the other way that, that Christians um, got the attention of pagans was through power evangelism. Right? The power of God was at work through them. And so my neighbor across the hall in my apartment complex, you know, their mother-in-law might be sick and in bed. And I'd be like, well, you know, we, we follow a guy who's a healer, who's able to heal. Would you mind if I pray for your Aunt Agatha or mother-in-law? And say, yeah, oh yeah, sure, whatever. In the name of Jesus, and Aunt Agatha gets healed. And then the pagans are like, wow, like this guy Jesus, like there's some spiritual juju there, right? Can you tell me more? And so that was the other way. It was by observing the power that was at work, the miraculous supernatural power that was at work through Christians, as well as, a, as observing their exemplary lives that got non-Christians non interested in finding out more about Christianity. And so what would happen is, if... Uh, Butch and I are working together, and um, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, Butch is not, of course. and I just happen to be a really, you know, we're at work, and our boss, the minute our boss isn't around, Butch kind of like takes it easy, but I keep, I keep working away. Butch is, at some point, Butch is like, well, why are you, like, their boss is not around. Why are you still working? Like, take it easy. I'm like, well, no, actually, you know, I want to honor my boss, and, and I believe that the Lord I, I worship, I, I feel like I'm working for him in whatever I do. Okay, forget Butch. Tim. <laughs> Tim's the baby. And, uh, right? And so Tim sees that I'm not robbing, right? I'm not, I'm not stealing from the till. And so Tim gets intrigued. I'm not going out and hanging out with the prostitutes after work. He invites me, you know, and I just say, Tim, sorry. I'm keeping myself sexually pure. What? Right? Because, again, that's a very different ethic than, than prevailed back then. Um, and so eventually Tim goes, after maybe observing me for a year or so, goes, well, you know, what I'm really... And we started talking about... I said, well, you know, I'm different because I follow this guy named Jesus. And I'm part of a community of people who are all trying to live according to his teachings. And we're trying to live lives that, 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 that are in accordance with his teachings, not what everybody else is doing. And so finally, Tim says, you know what? I, I think I want to be like you. I think I want what you have. I really want to give my life to Jesus, and I want to learn about this guy. What do you think am I going to do? Am I going to say, well, come on, and what we would do if that were today, we would say, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's raised from the dead, then you'll be saved. And he does that, you're saved, you're in, get you baptized, let's go. You're in. Okay? What they did, however, was I would say, okay, you're interested in learning more about Jesus. In fact, you're really interested in even coming like, like getting part of the community? Well, Tim, why don't you come and you're going to meet Marika. I'm going to take you, not on Sunday, I'm going to take you to talk to Marika, who's a teacher in the church, who has the gift of teaching. She's a pastor and teacher. And I'm going to take Tim to, to introduce you to Marika. And what Marika's going to do is, Marika actually isn't going to talk to you, probably she doesn't really care too much yet about what you think. Well, she might. But she's going to ask me as your friend, she's going to say, Ward, tell me a little bit about Tim. Do you think Tim is really serious about following Jesus? Do you think he's teachable? Do you think he's willing to stop going to the prostitutes? Do you think he's willing to stop robbing from his employer? Do you think he's teachable? Is he somebody who's genuinely interested? Is it legit? I say... Yeah, I think so. I think we should... Okay, and she says, okay. So then what's going to happen is I become Tim's sponsor. I'm his Christian sponsor, and I meet with him regularly to encourage him. We pray before work, and then he's going to start going to classes taught by Marika during the week. 
and their classes in, in what Jesus taught, the teachings of Jesus, their classes in biblical history, their classes in how a Christian should act in different situations. Like, for instance, you know, Tim, like, I know you're the pater familia of a big Roman household, and I know that, that Roman practice is that you can have sex with anybody in that household you want, whenever you want, which happened all the time, anybody, whether a boy or, or you know, anybody. But you know, Tim, Jesus, as Christians, we honor the marriage bed. Are, so, so, you know, so you begin teaching, they would involve, it would involve classes on, this is how Christians, when you go to the, the public baths, Tim, this is how you're supposed to dress. You're not supposed to ogle at the women as they're, you know. This is how, so, so Tim would be involved for one to two years, sometimes three years in this process. And the emphasis, and then after two years, Marika would meet with me and Tim again, and she would say, Ward, tell me about Tim. And she's probably been meeting with him, right, during the teaching him. But she'd say, tell me about Tim. I don't care so much about what he knows. Tell me about his life. Is he living a holy life? Is he changing? Is he still going to the prostitutes? Interestingly enough, one of the things they looked at during, over the course of this uh, discipling process was whether people developed a habit of ministering to the needs of the poor. And so that was very, very important. Marie could be like, well, is Tim, is he, is he helping the poor in his neighborhood on a regular basis? So she, the emphasis was on behavior, how someone lived their life, not on what they said. I'd argue today it's almost the reverse. We bought into this idea that, well, it's by faith you've been saved through grace, that not of yourselves, not the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, so for us, works don't matter at all. It doesn't matter what you do. As long as you say you're a Christian, it wouldn't go over well with Paul. Okay. I told Akina and Albert that I, that I, I felt pretty strongly about this and that I might go on a rant today, and they both kind of rolled their eyes, like, oh, please don't do that. I haven't been ranting today, have I? I've been kind of reining it in a bit. Okay, it was only then after two to three years of increasing participation in the life of the Christian community, and understand that Tim would not be permitted throughout this time to come to the Sunday morning service. It would only be near the end, after he'd been discipled about a year or so, that he would begin to be, to kind of be allowed to kind of hang out on the periphery of the Sunday morning gathering. Okay? Only after two to three years, and after the teacher was okay, you know, where Tim's sponsor said, yep, he's been coming regularly, He's been discipled for, for two to three years. I can, he's changed at work. I've seen his life change. He's not stealing anymore. He's not going to prostitutes. Right? Only at that point that Marika would say, all right, let's do this. They baptize him, and he would become a full member of the church. Now, some of us might be feeling very uncomfortable right now hearing about this whole approach. It seems so exclusive. It seems so legalistic. That's it. It's not nice. Right? And in our culture, the number one commandment is be nice. <laughs> you think I'm joking. That's absolutely true. What did Jesus preach? Be nice to people. Don't ever judge and be nice. Right? I'm just being honest. Okay, but we hear about this type of an approach, and it, it really makes us feel uncomfortable. Because it runs so counter to the way we do things in 21st century evangelicalism. It's contrary to our whole approach. See, we lower the bar, right? We lower the barrier, the bar, as far as possible. 
We lower the, every barrier to people hearing and accepting the gospel. We set the bar as low as possible for church membership. I mean, membership in this church is optional. And if you're a member, you've got to sit through a nine-week class where you get grounded in, in the bare essentials. And the reason it's nine weeks is because if it were ten weeks, nobody would take it. <laughs> Just being real. Few people ever become members. Even fewer people ever darken the door of an adult ed class. And the problem is, is that in the past, when I was growing up, in society, I would say our culture as a whole, our society, basically had a, at least a Judeo-Christian basic worldview. I mean, people didn't necessarily believe it. Right? I mean, I grew up going to a church where my parents didn't necessarily believe it, but they took us to church every Sunday. Right? You could assume if somebody came into the church, particularly if they'd grown up in the church or they'd been in the church for a number of years, I could pretty much assume if Mike, right, Mike came to the vineyard, started coming, I could pretty much assume that he had a kind of a biblical worldview, that he received some sort of instruction. I mean, I grew up at the Presbyterian Church, USA, Main Street, Charlottesville, frozen, chosen, deader than dead. Okay? But, before I was allowed to join the church, I had to sit in on a year of teaching and instruction at age 11. Yeah. Okay? We have nothing comparable And I'm just telling you, I see it, folks. I mean, I have people who have grown up in the church who come in who've never heard of the spiritual disciplines. I had a conversation with one guy. He was like, man, this is great. Like, all this stuff about spiritual, like, fasting and meditating on scripture. And this is great. I've never had this before. I grew up in a Christian home. And I just want to say, if it makes us, I think what concerns me the most is that, well, one, and, and again, it's, uh, I see it, okay, that's what you got to understand. Like, I see the results of such poor discipleship. And it's not because we want to be legalistic or we want to, it's because people suffer as a result. They continue to live lives that for that are in direct contradiction to the teachings of Jesus. And the leaders of the church, we're the ones who are there to pick up the pieces. And so you've got college students who are sleeping with a different woman every weekend, but they're leading small groups and they're leaders on campus. And so is it any wonder that non-Christians are not attracted to Christianity because for all intents and purposes, we're living like non-Christians. And I don't, I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to, if I'm passionate about this, this is something, this is the kind of thing that Rob and I, this is the kind of thing that drives me to distraction. Because it's not working. It's not. I mean, we need to wake up, folks. The church is in deep decline. And, and I'm convinced, and I, I don't, I don't rare, seldom say this from up front, but I believe that we, are gonna, we, are, we will shortly be reaching a point where we're going to be facing some really hard decisions. If you look at Europe, look at Europe and look at Canada. Okay? They are, both of them are approaching cultures that are post-Christian, which isn't that bad, except that they're very hostile to much of the things that we believe. There was a directive that was recently overturned, but that had been come down during the Obama administration that said that doctors, a Christian doctor, who didn't want to do a sex change operation on someone, would be forced to do that or lose their medical license. 
Now, regardless of, of where you come down on that whole transgender issue, the reality is, is that we're close to getting to a point where if you are a Christian and you don't believe in abortion, for instance, National Association of some nurses association two or three years ago brought that to a vote at their national convention. They wanted to force, they wanted to remove any kind of opt-out clause on the basis of conscience for abortions. Again, wherever you, regardless of where you come down on that side, there are Christians who, who believe that abortion is wrong and, and would want to opt out on ethical grounds of being involved in something like that. But we are fast getting to a point where that will no longer be an option. And so I just want to say, open your eyes, wake up. Because we're going to be forced at some point in the next five to ten years, I believe, to make some hard choices. Like Jacob Altman's mom, if you remember, he grew up, he was born in East Germany under the Soviets and the East Germans. His mom had a dream her whole life of becoming a medical doctor. But she refused to take the oath of the Communist Party, which denied the existence of God, and so she lost, she gave out on her dream. And we tell people, come to Jesus and you'll fulfill your dreams. I just think we're setting people up for, we're setting the large portions of the church up to just completely fold. And this, I'm sorry, I'm going on my rant now. Um, and I just don't think we're ready. And even if persecute, and here's the problem, we become so associated, not to get political, but we become so associated with Trump, the current president, in the minds of large sections of the culture, that whenever, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party takes over, there's going to be a tremendous backlash. Again, whether you're whichever side you're on, I don't. I'm not trying to. I'm just saying that that's where we're. That's where we're getting as a culture, and I think we're just we are losing. And here's the thing: even if things continued as they are, even if persecution doesn't happen, um, if trends continue, right, in 10, 20, 30 years, churches are going to be gutted. Nobody's going to be coming. And it will be because of consumerism, because we've just become part of the culture. We've become completely, you know, there's no difference between us and the culture. And so, I don't know that I have an answer. One of the answers, the early church, folks, you know, after a couple hundred years of Christianity being the dominant faith and culture, then the church became kind of co-opted by culture and became very enculturated and worldly. And a lot of Christians just said, you know what, like, they're kind of in a similar situation to where we're in now. And they just said, you know what, we're going to go, not going to try to change the church, we're just going to go create a monastery. For those people who want to get really serious about their faith, we're going to try to, you know. Anyway, so... Tim has his head in his hands, so that's not a good sign. Um, we were going to actually have a Q&A today. It's 11.04. We were going to have a Q&A today with Elijah and Betty and myself and um, about this whole, oh, and Robin, and about the question of making disciples and then also any questions that might have arisen related to Matthew, the, since this is the end of our series. Next week? You want a Q&A next week? Okay. Next week. Yes? Are you suggesting that discipleship requires us to judge who is allowed to be Who is allowed to be very necessary question. No, I think that's a good question. So Paul would say, right, do not be deceived. A man who... Repeat the question. Yeah. So does, does discipleship require that we decide who is going to make it into heaven or not, right? And, and I would say this, I believe that we have created, we don't read Paul, we read snippets of Paul. So we take a sentence here and a, and a sentence here, and we've created this theology that is, and we believe it comes from Paul, and it doesn't. Because Paul actually, I would say yes, 
We do do that. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul said. In 1 Corinthians, he said, judge those who are inside the church. Don't judge those outside the church. You don't expect them to, you know, you shouldn't expect them to live a biblical ethic because they're not Christians. But whoever calls himself a Christian and whose life doesn't bear fruit, the fruit of holiness, you can question whether their salvation is genuine. So good works don't save us in Pauline theology, but good works are the natural fruit of a genuine salvation. And if there are no good works, according to Paul, you can question, at least question, whether there is a genuine salvation. And the early church did this all the time, including Paul. Well, Jesus says, judge. He told his disciples, judge. But just judge rightly. And Paul, again, and so the issue with Jesus when he said, don't judge, right, is he said, remove, the reason that, that we're not to judge is we're not to judge in a hypocritical, self-righteous fashion like the Pharisees. But Jesus said, remove the splinter from your eye, right? Then you'll be able to see so you can remove the log from your brother's eye. So it's not that we don't judge, it's just that we do so in humility and we do so with the recognition that all of us struggle and, and that we need to get our own house in order first before we can, right? And so it's, it's, it's so tough because what's happened is the cults, right? Like we hear about this kind of stuff and all we can think of are like the Jehovah's Witnesses or some wack -a, wackadoodle cult that just, you know, controls people's lives. And because it's just so foreign to us, it really is. But I just, again, I want to say, how's that working out for us? It's not. And so there's got to be, and I, again, I don't, have, I don't have an answer at this point. Um, but yeah, how do, we, how do we better train people? How do we rework their worldview so that they, they think Christianly? Just, I feel like there are a lot of questions and perhaps some unresolved tension in the room. Do, do, do a lot of people want to move forward to the Q&A? Because I'll be honest, I want to press forward on some of these points. Sure. I do. I want to talk. Do people want to move forward? <laughs> I don't know. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, people just wanting into worship, absolutely. Uh, I just feel like there are some things that people are, are bristling, and, and it might actually be better to talk through these issues. So, yeah. <laughs> just I'm throwing it out there. I mean, where are we? We're a congregation, She's right? like nodding her head. Hold her in her seat, and Don't let her come out. <laughs> And listen, folks, I, I, listen, I can, I, I am really, I, I mean, I'm struggling with this too, because I don't like, I mean, I, there, there's a certain level of angst that I feel. But what I want you to hear is that I, I feel conflicted over this because I see, I see the, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? I, I just see the people who struggle. I see the, the side effects of, of not discipling people more, not having a robust way. I just see, I'm the one who, at Betty, and you know, we're the ones who, who deal with people who are, who are struggling, right? And caught in this cycle of just, and it, it's, it's tragic. I'm so sorry, Tim. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> sorry, let's get it. Where are you sitting, huh? <laughs> um, just to push back on what you said, there's not an answer. There is an answer, and you've said it already in your sermon. Okay. The answer is power evangelism. No one can debate. No one can debate with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's never wrong. In our culture today, people have a lot of head knowledge. That goes out the window when someone's arm grows. That goes out the window when someone's leg grows. I've seen that. I've had people who argue and then they see a miracle. You cannot argue with a miracle. So the answer is the same answer from Acts. It is power evangelism. You have people who come to Christ, get filled with the Spirit, miracles, signs, and wonders always accompany that. So that is the answer for today, the same answer from Acts. You need the Holy Spirit working in your life through signs and wonders, through miracles. And the culture cannot debate a miracle. So I think, I, so I think that that is... 
Oh, so am I might, I guess I got cut off. Oh, you got cut. Okay, so John, I say part of that, yes. But the problem is, is that the current, the issue, the other half of it is the moral, the moral aspect. Are we, do we look like the culture? I mean, the Corinthians had all sorts of miracles, right? And Paul's response was, miracles are not the sign of, miracles and spiritual experience are not the sign of Christian maturity. Love is, right? And so I think that, I think that, yes, we need, desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit working through us to perform miracles, because I think that definitely God uses that to draw people to himself. But I also think we need the power of the Holy Spirit working in us by the practice of the spiritual disciplines so that we can live godly lives. Lives that, that aren't co-opted by the consumerism and the materialism of our culture. So I'd say kind of like, yes, but, or yes and. So I just want to say, um, the Bible says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so um, that is not individual. It is meant in a community fashion. So we, we all need to work out our salvation together with fear and trembling. That's what we're doing today, and we are going to do it within a time frame that is okay. We're not going to, so don't, you know. Because I think the concern is there might be some of you who are good. You're chill, you, you got it, okay? You're not concerned today. But then there are those of you who might be angry. And the Bible also says to not grumble in our sanctification. So if you have issues of concern, we need to work out together this, okay? It may not be today, but if you leave here with questions, theological questions that you're struggling with, do not go home and complain. That's not Christ-like. That's not his spirit in you. That's the flesh. What God is calling you to do is work out unity in the body and to discuss with your brothers and sisters. So I just want to put that out there. This is just a short little time, just a, a little bit of a carving out of time right now. But we need to work these things out, okay? We're, we're with one another in Christ, okay? Thank you, Betty. I think that was really well put. And then that's probably why I wanted to move forward with this today. War tonight. So Ward and I have talked about this a lot, and, and I, I'm with him in so many ways. We're about to disagree. And, uh, <laughs> no, my, my sense, though, is that um, perhaps there's just some confusion, because I don't think I really disagree with you on this. Yeah. Um, so I just want to ask a, a couple questions. So the first would be, um, you talked about you know, the example of the church in the second and third century, um, and, and can contrast that with the first century and the way they did evangelism. So my first question would be, right, as a church that bases itself in the scriptures and sees the scriptures even challenging the, the church tradition, should we not still say, even like with the Corinthians, where the churches are a mess, this perhaps allows that God even allows a messy church and this part of the way he works? Amen. Um, shouldn't the, the example of the New Testament challenge the example of the second and third centuries and not vice versa? Uh, and with that is this question of, and we talk about the church being influenced by the culture, but how much of the very secretive practices of the second and third century were actually, you know, partly a reflection of the practice also of the fertility cults and the secrecy that surrounded those. And it was kind of an easy model to adopt, especially in light of persecution. I'm not saying it was necessarily wrong for that time, but that may also have been kind of a reflection of culture. So yeah. there's a starting point. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I would say that the model of the early church initially in terms of their cultists, their Sunday gatherings, was not the fertility cults, but was the synagogue. And so I would say that the, if there was secrecy, right, if they, if, it were, if they were closed, and I'm not arguing that we should go back to our services being closed. Right, and I'm not saying, that's why I'm saying I wrestle, but understand that, that we are following an approach, and we have followed an approach to taking our culture for Jesus, right? that has radically different presuppositions from that, than the approach that was used by the early church that was successful, right? I mean, like, they have a pretty good track record. It, up to this point, we don't. And so I guess what I'm wrestling with is, I think we need to be aware of those presuppositions. I mean, you talk, you've mentioned the fact that we've designed our gospel, right, our gospel presentation, our church, it's been shaped far more by consumerism, right, than, we're, than we even acknowledge, right? When we go online and we see 
folks at pretty much any mega church, and they're up on a huge stage, and they've got lights, and they're looking good, like ding, you know, like all their worship leaders are just gorgeous, and they, they all look the same. They got the scruff and the skinny jeans, and and the lights are out, right? Like the the, the congregation is, you can't even see them, right? So you're basically You've created a worship service that for all intents and purposes looks like a concert. And I think that that reinforces very unhealthy you know, tendencies in the church. For instance, for us to be passive if we're sitting out in the, right? To reinforce that idea that only the people up on stage are important. Or anyways, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh. No, um, what you were saying is actually leads right into what I think is really significant. Um, so going back to the Bill Hybels quote, um, one of the most important things about that in particular was the idea of what does it actually mean to self-feed, right? Um, because uh, one of my favorite books on what it means to kind of um, do college ministry well um, is by Steve Garber, it's called Fabric of Faithfulness. And he examines um, the stories of people after they graduate from college and particularly various college ministries and asks what is the pattern of what they have been formed by or lack thereof um, that has determined whether or not they actually know um, what it means to live faithfully um, after the college years. And the biggest challenge that kind of arises is how do you live um, with the Christian worldview, surrounded by people who don't have your same worldview? Um, how do you process the dissonance that will come when you enter into a predominantly, for lack of a better word, like non-Christian um, world, right? Um, dominated by um, thoughts and values that have nothing to do with this countercultural life that we are called to live. Um, and his point then is that we do not do a good job forming people in what it actually means to follow Jesus. We have spent all of our energy, speaking to college ministries, um, trying to make people um, you know, enjoy um, gathering together and worshiping while neglecting um, and forgetting um, that there is a world that's like actually out to get us, right? Um, we talked, um, Elijah spoke about the arena of, of different thoughts um, and that's not just in Athens, that's not just in Ephesus, that's not just in Rome, um, but it's actually the very world we live in, right? And college campuses are actually exactly that. Um, and so when we allow the influence of what um, the world and culture is teaching, and that actually becomes dominant to how we think about the world we live in rather than the Bible, um, when we go into the workplace, um, go into what's considered, I guess, real life after college. Um, we don't have sufficient um, grounding in that worldview, right? That is literally why I semi forced Ward to <laughs> revamp the 201 class um, so that it wasn't just, you know, three weeks, four weeks that, you know, easy content, um, but actually really digs deep into what does it mean um, to live a life of faithfulness. What does it actually mean to continue um, learning the practical things that it takes um, to live and feed yourself? I talk with students all the time, I see who has a question, but uh, I talk with students all the time um, who have graduated from college and are recognizing that they do not know how to read the Bible for themselves, right? So, yeah. I mean, we're on the mouth, John, I got it. Okay. So basically, I can, I can remember, I can remember leaving college and having it with me. Everything was new. My city was new. Um, I had to figure out how to get to work. My work was new. The people were new. Feeding myself was new. All this stuff was new. At, at the time it happened to me, I was not a Christian, so this wasn't an issue for me. So I can only imagine how difficult it must be to look for a church after you've graduated because there's so much new stuff. Is there a way that we as a church could help people, uh, students and new graduates, somehow be taught or be given the confidence to be able to look for a church or to do research before they move? 
I, I, think, I can only yeah. imagine how difficult it must be. Well, I think part of Robin's point is that the way that we have been doing discipleship, right, uh, particularly even, you know, speaking in terms of college students, um, ill prepares them for moving out into the real world where they're not surrounded by other Christian friends 24-7 and they, they can they go to five different prayer groups and even you know, like you know in college you're in this it's awesome it's like heaven 24 seven you know you want to pray there's somebody right next door who's gonna pray or encourage you and then you get out in the real world and it's like man it all goes away immediately and and, and people just again statistically people are just falling in droves college students who graduate and so that's where again I wrestle with we're not doing a good job of forming people and and sermons are not enough right like sermons are not going to do it the sermons just scratch the surface and you know 24 7 you guys are getting we're, we're getting the world 24 7 and then maybe for two hours a week maybe you hear like a, a you know a, a talk that you're going to forget by the time you get to that corner down there by, on Trip Hammer, right? And so, what do, you know, how do we, and we have adult ed classes, we have new members classes, but nobody takes them. I mean, it's just, it's just the fact, because we all feel like, oh, we're, we don't need them. But people don't even know what they don't know. Like the experience of the couple who took the new members class two weeks ago, who've been in the church for years, they said, man, we had no idea. We were blown away at how in-depth it was and what. And I'll say one last thing and I'll be quiet. <laughs> I need to apologize. So I, if, if I had grown up in a legalistic church, or if my experience over the years had been primarily with legalistic condemning churches, I would be more sensitive and I wouldn't always be like, cheap grace, you know, down with cheap grace and we need to get tougher and we need to... It's just that when I look out at the religious culture in America, I feel like the, pro the primary problem is not legalism and condemning people. The primary problem is just cheap grace, like it's no big deal. And so I have a tendency to over, perhaps overemphasize kind of tough love. Uh, and I know that some of you who grew up in maybe a legalistic church or are more sensitive to that, you know, that really grates. And so I just want to apologize, and that's why we have a teaching team, too, so other more grace-filled people can balance it. <laughs> more grace -filled. Robin, do you have any ideas to address that issue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so at least for uh, Ivy, Joe does a great job. Um, so she actually meets with seniors um, and helps them process what does it mean to make that transition. Um, I think that the foundation is doing Bible study where it's not teaching, um, but you're actually developing your own exegetical intuition. So your own um, intuition as to being willing to be wrong in the context of people who can help guide you in how you're studying the Bible, exactly. so that you're not left to your own devices to keep failing. Mm -hmm. um, which then leads to the point that Steve Garber makes is that you need a mentor. You need a mentor um, who basically in the midst of um, all of the formation of your worldview is helping you to process and recognize, as Ward said, you don't know what you don't know. But that mentor knows because they've been there, they've done that, they've struggled, right? Um, and so, so that, I think that's the key. I love the idea of a sponsor, right? I mean, I, I mentioned that I've been meeting with a guy since July who has kind of gone through a rough patch in his life. He's been in the church for years. And I think for the first time in his life, he's learning. Uh, we've been meeting from 6 to 7 every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right? And, and what it's shown me, it's been great for me, now having somebody to share my quiet time with, but it's, incre it's, it's done a couple of things. One, it's been very encouraging because I've seen somebody's life being transformed by the gospel and as he learns to submit and, and, ca and hold every thought captive. And, but it's also shown me how labor intensive it is and how long it takes to take somebody who's, who's got a lifetime of habits and thinking and, and, and reshape, watch, you know, the Holy Spirit reshape that. It's very time intensive and labor intensive. 
and that's where I love the idea of this early church idea of a sponsor, right? Where someone comes along and mentors. Okay. So Peter and, and Tim and Thomas have a lot of questions, but just very quickly, then I'll shut up. Um, so it sounds to me like you're talking about spiritual formation, which we've talked a lot, a lot about that. Um, my question is though, right? Are you saying a spiritual formation should come before baptism, before the commitment, which, right? Or after? And, and here's what I want to preface that with. If it was before Lord, if you have had this conversation with me four years ago, I would probably not be here today and I'd probably not be teaching. Mm. It was the grace that you showed me in all of my questions and all I'm my actually a very nice guy. <laughs> right? It was, right? No, it's true, right? I mean, Ward was one of the first Christians that legitimately allowed me, since I left Yale, to raise these serious issues. And it wasn't just immediate argument and immediate judgment. And that changed my life. And I, I bristled today because I said, hmm, you know, Ward we'll, we'll is on to something, but. This isn't really what he says all the time. So I, I want to hear, I want to hear, you know. It's only so like what I want to rant in front of everybody. <laughs> well, maybe it's, okay, so if somebody came to me today, this is what I'm thinking about. Okay, so if somebody came to me today and said, I want to be baptized, right? Like, it, like I'm going to pick on Mark Pettit again, because he's kind of like my poster child. He's like the, the, he's like the golden boy. Mark is awesome. He's like just, oh my gosh. Give me a little bit of Mark. I mean, if I could just... He, uh, so, so he got baptized, and he, he is like following... I mean, he got baptized like two, three years ago. He has been following hard after Jesus. And he meets with me. He's been meeting with me weekly. He's been meeting with John Bree weekly. He's been, I mean, just hitting it in his own life. And so, like, that's, that's what... Oh, yeah, okay. I'm, okay. Um, so... But not everybody does that, right? Like sometimes people, and so I guess today, I'm starting to think like if someone approaches me and says I want to be baptized, okay, maybe not saying you gotta jump through all these hoops beforehand, but here's what we, here's part of baptism, part of, 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 of making this new commitment and, and doing it in a way that, that where you'll succeed, that'll be successful from a spiritual point of view is that's gonna involve taking the new members class, right? And that's gonna involve meeting with somebody once a week in prayer, right, uh, uh, mm -hmm. for the first year, right? Maybe something like that. Where people, if they know that that's kind of what's expected of them, and, they're, and it's a genuine, they're, gen, you know, they're genuinely interested, most people would be willing to do that. I mean, I would have done anything when I came to the Lord, buddy. You had told me Christians stay up till 12 every night praying. I would have done it, right? <laughs> uh, I hope my question... Um, um, I hope my question gets kind of right to the heart of the issue before I ask it. I'd like to make one statement. You have said repeatedly that nobody takes the new members class. Nobody reads Paul. Nobody does this. <laughs> nobody does that. And you're, I'm, I've done all of those you things. Do. Yes. And I do try. Right? So, and I know I'm not the only person here, and I'm not saying this to, to put myself up because I need to take an adult ed class. I know that. I'm thirsty for it because of my past. I've had people in the church tell me that I don't deserve salvation, and I'm hurting from that. Yeah, and that's part of why I get fired up. So I'm hoping this gets right to the issue. Yeah. Um, because I know I know and trust all of you, and I think you all have a good sense of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I want to say this publicly, Lord, I do I do love arguing with you. Bro, <laughs> right? So um, so just to clear that up. Um, so my question is, we know discipleship is vital. Yes. I would not be here today if I had not had a very important mentor. I wouldn't. I would have fallen away because the struggles that came after I left college were hard. But the things that that mentor told me brought me through. He helped me to have the faith that I needed to get through. And I think that we all need that. We need discipleship. But we also need love. Yeah. And I think that that's come out in these questions. Um, I think that was the piece I was concerned about with your sermon. Yeah. So my question would be, yes, it's super important to disciple new believers. And I do agree that that's missing. I think we, a lot of us do. But it's also important to show grace and love. Um, oh, absolutely. Like Elijah was saying. So how do we combine those? And this might be rhetorical. This might be a long-term question. But how do we combine those two things today in our church? Right. 
Um, Boy, let me take the first part of that. There, <laughs> Sorry. Come on down, buddy. Come on, come on down. Come on. Teaching team. You can. <laughs> Teaching team. Come on. Come on. This, this is not the answer. This is the first part of that answer. It gets really confusing to talk about these things. One thing that gets really confusing is in the Greek the New Testament is written in, there are two different words for judge that both translate into English as judge. So when we're talking about, you know, like, like judging somebody's salvation or, or judging where they're at in their spiritual walk, it gets very confusing. The two words, one carries the idea of uh, putting somebody to the test so you can point at how they've fallen, the mistakes they've made, how they failed, so you cannot prove them. And that's generally the one that's used in, in a, a negative sense of do not judge. And then we see, you know, do judge those within the church. It uh, speaks of a motive of putting somebody to the test to point at their, their growth, their successes, progress that they've made so you can approve them. So just the, those two words both coming into English as judge makes it very, very confusing. But yeah, that's just the first part. Go right ahead. Yeah. Well, I would just say, and I'm going to let Betty close us. I did want to say, um, I don't, you know, at this point, when I think about new new believers, right? I mean, I, I think, and I, I, we're in an elder-run church, so I'm going to have to run this by the elders. But I, I think that I, probably what we may ask people to do is take, you know, if you, if you want to be baptized, take the Foundations for Faithfulness course and be be mentored by somebody for, I don't know, six to 12 months, right? Meet, agree to meet with them regularly and pray. And so it might be something along that line for people who who are new believers, because I want to see them succeed, right? I don't want people, I hate, this is, part of what this comes out of is the, is the and I have had people in my life who I love, who, who have walked away from the faith, right? Who have, who, whose lives have become a shipwreck. Mm. People who went from, just love and Jesus and just joy to just, just void of all joy. And so I, I mean, if I, if I sound like just a mean guy up here, like it's, it comes out of seeing people's lives, people get hurt and I don't want that. Um, and I would just say for me, the bigger question is what do we do about people who are already Christians? Who come to the church. That to me is the bigger, the, 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 the tougher thing to figure out, right? Like what do we do with the fact that most of us have been going to church for multiple years? I think that for me is the bigger hurdle, like uh, in terms of figuring out. But why don't you close this up? I think Ward was starting to get to the heart of his heart <laughs> just then. And I think um, the issue today, what, what Ward is hoping to um, come across is in the word it says the sow and the seed that people come, they hear the word, receive it with joy, but having no root, they yeah. fall away. And I think the point is, we desire the church to have roots, to grow, to know what they believe. And that's, that's the whole issue, I think, of this, this topic of discipleship. We want to know where you guys are struggling. We want to know what to teach that will, will equip you, will strengthen us, will give us roots. And it's in the Word, but, but there are things that the church struggles with in season. We need to know what to speak on that, that we're really struggling with. Um, but that, that's the heart of it. Um, we, need to, we need to abide in Christ. That's where the life is. Okay, So we need to find out where our brothers and sisters are not abiding and why. Okay? Why can't you read the word? Why can't you pray? We need, to, we need to ask those questions to one another. Because we should be praying and we should be reading. That's where discipleship starts. Find out what, what's not going well because you care for them. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that's the right. So, so we talked a little bit about redefining judge, um, but I think we also need to redefine or clarify the definition of love. Because it's not loving to invite someone into the body of Christ and then leave them to flounder. Mm. Right. And it is not loving to raise people up um, and then not equip them to go out. Right. Like If we're making disciples and teaching, then we actually have to do that. 
right? Um, it is not loving for me to say it is okay to keep on sinning, right? It is actually because I know what is coming down the pipe as your mentor for you, if you continue in what you are doing, that you will actually miss out on the fullness of life that I have gotten to taste, and I want you to taste that too because I love you. Right? That is love. Amen. Okay. Um, real quick, and it's more it's something that has not been brought up that you preach about all the time. Um, accountability sometimes is having a workout partner, you know, and having somebody, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're all a family, and I know when I go back to see my family, if my sister disapproves of something I'm doing, she tells me about it, and then we talk about it, and then I decide whether I think she's right or she's wrong, and then I move on, but it helps me to have that conversation, and I think that's conversations like this is what we need to have, and when you see your brother or sister in Christ not maybe holding up to a standard, then maybe you should mention it. It doesn't mean that you're judging whether or not they go to heaven because we don't get to do that. That's not us. Um, and as far as spiritual growth, we're always spiritually growing. I mean, everybody in here is still on their path to spiritually grow. You should be spiritually growing until, and I just realized my collars popped up. Um, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. But, um, it's, we're spiritually growing until until the day we die. We have a chance to spiritually grow, and hopefully, with all of us together, we're all helping each other grow, continue to grow. And I think that's kind of the point: is that we don't give up, and we don't just assume that because you've been dumped in the water that you're that's it, you're good, fly be free. You know, we are we're here for each other, we love each other, and that means we're a part of each other's lives, and we can to be a part of each other's life. So, well, I think we're going to have one last comment. I'm going to say something and then we got it. Okay, Pastor? Inconvenience yourself for others if you want to be successful. Okay? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm nervous about public speaking, but I, I have a history to offer. I'm 70 years old and I, I'm a graduate. Dropped out of college uh, around 1970. Anyway, it happened that the church that I ended up in was a mega church uh, that preached radical grace. And the pastor was terribly criticized by others. But he also taught uh, in thorough teaching every night of the week except this Sabbath, which was Saturday night, for two hours. He taught deep through the whole Old Testament Old New Testament in the original languages, explained verse by verse. This man was terribly long as a radical grace teacher. Uh, I don't think it's exclusive uh, mega church or whatever, or radical grace or discipleship. He was a great guy. The foundation he gave me over two years of attending his teaching for, uh, was foundation for a lot. So it's not exclusive. And my also uh, the history in Asia. So when the Lord talks about we are failing, I guess he's talking about here in America. In Asia, the mega churches in Singapore, I went there multiple and I went to multiple ones. Great deep teaching, wonderful radical grace teacher. Uh, founding churches all over Asia, uh, recruiting missionaries from their churches to go all over the world, including USA. So it's not mutually exclusive. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Thank you. Well, why don't I go ahead and close us in prayer, and then um, today is a communion <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> I took it. I think that we did. I don't I mean, what does somebody think who comes to this church for the first time, and it's kind of like this on a Sunday? Well, are you going to come steal the mic from me? <laughs> but you can do it to me. Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, this morning um, in my devotional, I was reading from James, uh, and this is the, the verse that I read, today or tomorrow, so come now, um, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. You do not even know what tomorrow will bring. Yeah. I didn't understand what that would mean for today, but now you. <laughs> Uh, and in a sense, we come to church on a Sunday, we go to our kinship with an idea of what we would do. I came this morning with an idea that we'd be doing worship. 
But often, Ward and I have spoken and said, we need to be led by God. We need to allow Him to take us and to, do, to give us a direction and that we follow that direction. Amen. This morning as a worship team, I was talking to the guys about being ready for the, for the direction of the wind of the Spirit to change the direction and we take that direction. Okay? And that's exactly what's happened in this service. Um, would I li have liked to have done worship uh, prepared? Yes. But if God is leading in a different direction, let's just get out of the way and let God do what He has to do. So, um, I just want to say, you know, we need to see this often, where God will say, we need, you need to go in this direction, and we need to be okay with going in that direction. Thank you. Can, can we close with... with Thanks, Tim. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can I just, right? Yeah. The reality is, like, there were tensions for a little bit after the sermon. Yeah, there were things that needed to be teased out, but here's the reality. We all partake of the blood and body of Jesus. Woo! So what a beautiful way like, to end a service, just to reaffirm that and to thank, to thank God for the unity that comes in Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.